Well, for those of you who are here regularly, will know where we are in the Bible. But for all of us, so we all included here, is that we are in Hebrews chapter 5, and we want to focus on chapter 5 and verses 1 to 10 for the last time in a while. So keep your Bibles open there. Hebrews 5 and verse 1. Oh, sorry, Hebrews 5 and verse 1, yes. Now it's important to know that Jesus Christ's high priesthood is at the heart of the book of Hebrews, or the letter to the Hebrews. It's all about Christ, his superiority, you remember, over all the Old Testament prophets, uh, over, in fact, everything in the Old Testament, his superiority also over the angels, his superiority over everything else in creation, he, Jesus being the supreme one. But particularly, it's Christ's far superior priesthood, more than anything else, that makes the new covenant better than the old covenant. Jesus has done what all the multitude of Old Testament priests and all the literally millions of animal sacrifices that were offered up through the eons over thousands of years put together could never have done. And here in chapter 5, you'll remember that Jesus' high priesthood is compared with the Aaronic priesthood. That is Aaron and the Levites in the Old Testament. Now I wonder, is there any one of you who can remember what function the Old Testament priests performed in the Old Testament times? Can anybody remember? It's very important, just in one or two words. It doesn't have to be the same thing. They offered sacrifices, okay? Anything else? A mediator, okay, okay, good, okay, intercession, anything else? Well, the Old Testament priests were all, pre, uh, priests were all those things, but they were, as someone described, also bridge builders to God. People could not come directly into God's presence. Why not? Well, because God is holy. He is the thrice holy God. And we are sinful. Like the people in the Old Testament were. And because of His holiness and our sin, God's wrath is upon this world and people. Because of our sin, His wrath, His rejection, His judgment, His condemnation, hangs over this world terribly. So because of that, God appointed certain men to be ushers, if you like. If you go to a movie house, you get people who will show you to your seat. God appointed certain men to be ushers, to bring the Israelites into his presence. And the way to God was opened only as the priests offered Sacrifices, as you rightly said, day in and day out, year after year, century after century, 24-7, presenting the blood of animals to God. So the priests were mediators and intercessors for us, or the Old Testament saints, that is. What were the qualifications to be a Jewish high priest? Well, verses 1 to 4 gives us three basic qualifications for a Jewish high priest. He needed to be appointed by God. He needed to be sympathetic to the people he ministered to. And he also had to offer sacrifices on their behalf. So let's just read there, verses 1 to 4. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. 
This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God just as Aaron was. But now verses 5 to 10 uh, go on to show us how Jesus Christ fulfilled all three of these requirements and how his qualifications are in fact far superior to any Jewish high priests. Verse 5. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him, the NIV says, from death, probably a better translation would be through death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation of all who obey him. And was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Well, strange name in our day. We don't, we don't know people with that name so much anymore. But now looking honestly at chapter 5, we can come to no other conclusion that Jesus Christ is the only perfectly qualified, completely equipped high priest, far superior to anything that Aaron could ever offer. We saw this, first of all, in his appointment. A high priest had to be a man to represent human beings before God. Jesus was the perfect man, you see? A high priest had to be God's man. God had to appoint him. In the Old Testament times, the lines of Aaron and Levi were set apart for this task by God's appointment. Now, Jesus Christ is not set apart in the same way. He is God's appointed son, and his priesthood is eternal. Not in the order of Aaron, but in the order of Melchizedek. And if you go and read further into Hebrews, you'll see uh, the symbolism there is Melchizedek had no beginning or end. So, eternal. So Jesus' appointment to the ministry is superior to any other appointment. It doesn't matter who it is. If it was the Old Testament priests, or pastors, or elders, and deacons today, or some who call them prophets, selves, prophets today, or whatever. It's Jesus Christ today. Jesus. Not people. Jesus. Last time we focused on Jesus' superior sympathy. Now Jesus is God, so he's omniscient. He knows all things. And omniscience knows everything. Perfect sympathy feels everything. Omnipotence, that means you're all-powerful, can do all things. But perfect sympathy experiences all things. You see, when Jesus came to earth, he did not have to learn any new information when he came to earth. He was omniscient. He was all-knowing. But he chose, in his human nature, to participate fully in the human experience. And that included human feelings, so that he could be perfectly sympathetic with us. All feeling, if you like. Remember, we said that Jesus is metriopatheo. That's the original word for it. Hebrews chapter 2. He is able to deal gently, metriopatheo, with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject 
to weakness, speaking about the Old Testament high priest. But now, like a true high priest, Jesus can deal gently, be very sympathetic with those who are going astray because of their ignorance and sin and suffering. Jesus perfectly understands our human weakness. He suffered just like us as a man. Only a lot worse. But on the other hand, just like a true high priest should, he is also moderately affected by our circumstances. When the wheels come off for us, when you're in trouble, you have no further resources, you're at the end of your tether. Jesus feels with us. He is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Yes, but praise his name. He also remains objective. He is not overcome by our difficult situations like we are. If you go and help somebody in trouble and you see them really suffering, the real danger there is that, is that you would yourself be overcome by that situation. Maybe even join the person in their suffering and their trouble. But Jesus is fully there with you. He understands fully, yet he is able to minister to your needs in a very sympathetic or feeling way. And because he's all-powerful, he can do something. He can do something, I should say, about your situation. Now, today on uh, we focus on Jesus' third qualification for his superior high priestly ministry, if you like. And we, we call it Jesus' superior sacrifice. And we are going to look at verses 1 and 9 and 10. Verse 1 says, Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, the Jewish priests offered gifts to God on behalf of the people. Leviticus chapter 2 records, verse 1, When someone brings a grain offering to the Lord, his offering is to be a fine flour. He is to pour oil on it, put incense on it, and take it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And the priest shall take a handful of fine flour and oil together uh, with all the incense and burn this as a memorial portion on the altar, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. So the people would bring their gifts and the priest would offer it up to God. But then the Jewish high priest also had to offer sacrifices for the people. And Hebrews 5 verse 3 says he, had to, he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. Now, it's the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that the writer to the Hebrews had in mind here. Once a year, that big sacrifice was made. And the priest would go, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies in the temple. It was closed with the curtain and only the high priest could go in there. Leviticus 16, verses 6 to 10. It's just a little snippet from that whole chapter that I'm reading to you. But it will explain, it, it explains everything very, very clearly there in Leviticus chapter 16. It says there from verse 6, Aaron is to offer the bull was a bull that they had to bring for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats. Throw the dice if you like. One lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Have you ever, ever, ever heard the word scapegoat used? The expression, uh, he's just a scapegoat, you know? Yeah, comes from here. 
Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. That was on the altar. And that was for the sins or the rebellion of the people. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. Also for the sin of the people. So what do we have here? Firstly, a sacrifice was made for, for Aaron himself. He was just a man, like everybody else. He, he had sin. Secondly, the sacrifice was made for the rebellion of people. For the rebellion of the people, the two goats. One goat was offered and killed, but the other one became what they called the scapegoat. Now, what is the significance of the scapegoat? Well, the scapegoat deals with the nature and the extent of the punishment for sin. Why is our sin such a big problem for us? Why can't we just go on living in sin and, and think all oh, will be okay? I'll do a few good deeds and everything will be okay. Our sin separates us from God's loving presence. It earns us God's condemnation and wrath. Let me ask you, why is hell such a terrible place? Oh, it is a fire and it's like a fire and it's a terrible place, but it is mostly terrible because it is eternal separation from the loving presence and grace of God in Jesus Christ. No hope for salvation ever in all eternity. And as Spurgeon once said, people in hell cry out, if only, if only, if only I trusted in Christ, I wouldn't have ended up in this situation. And now we come to the real issue here. Why was Jesus' suffering on the cross so terrible? Why does Jesus cry out on the cross according to Matthew chapter 26 and 47? At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, because he was separated from his father in your place. Jesus became your scapegoat. Like the scapegoat was forsaken in the desert for the sin of the people, so Jesus was forsaken on the cross for your sin. He endured hell in your place, a place of utter forsaking by the God of love and grace. Now don't make a mistake here. A lot of people think, well, no, hell is controlled by the devil and the devil rules over hell and so Not at all. God rules over everything. Even Christ is the, becomes the judge of the wicked. And Christ rules over hell. And as Spurgeon also said, there he rules not with a golden crown, in heaven, he rules with a golden crown and he's a god of love, but in hell, he rules with an iron crown. You see? So the forsaking there is a forsaking from, a forsaking from the God of love and grace. The perfect eternal love relationship between the Father and his Son was interrupted on the cross. He was forsaken. He became the scapegoat for you. This brings us to Jesus' a superior and perfect sacrifice. Verse 9. Read there with me. Once made perfect, once he completed his work on the cross, 
He finished his work on earth. When he cried out, it is finished upon that cross, like the song says. And like we read in John chapter 19, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. <coughs> Jesus' the sacrifice was superior, sorry, because he was sinless and therefore he was able to deal with our sin effectively. He didn't have to offer up a sacrifice for himself like the high priest did. He had no sin. He is just perfect. Uh, Hebrews 4 verse 15 tells us that he was without sin. The pure, innocent little Lamb of God, without spot or wrinkle or blemish. He was always in perfect fellowship with his Father. He was nev never separated from the Father because of his own sin, like we are. No. Why was it necessary for Jesus to be sinless, to be our High Priest? Well, you had to live a sinless life for you in your place. Remember, when you trust in Jesus, you're not just forgiven. We, our sins are taken and placed upon Jesus and He's crushed for our sin. But His righteous life is reckoned to us in the same way when you trust in Him. So his perfect life becomes your life when you trust in Christ. God sees you as sinless, just like Jesus lived. And he forgives you and you are become guiltless because of his sacrifice in your place. And the fact that Jesus was sinless qualified him to become the sacrifice himself. In fact, this is a contradiction, it's <coughs> irony. He who needed no sacrifice for sin willingly becomes the sacrifice of all sacrifices. And then Jesus' sacrifice was superior because it was once for all eternity. Verse 9, he became the source of eternal Salvation. Now, no Old Testament priest could offer the people eternal salvation like Jesus our high priest does. At best, they could only offer you a very temporary measure for sin. And God only overlooked the sin of the people for another year through Aaron's sacrifice. And God kept on overlooking the sin, but it never, he never actually dealt with it until God finally dealt with all the sin of all believers in the Old Testament and believers in the New Testament and believers today eternally through the one sovereign act. Christ, his son's perfect sacrifice on the cross. So it's understandable that through the cross, Jesus' sacrifice, the need of the temple and the tabernacle and the Levitical priesthood and the ceremonial law was ended forever. I don't know where people get this from. I said, the temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem and the Jewish order will be restored at the end of time. You know, you must have heard that. Uh, the dispensational view of, 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 of salvation and so on. But it makes a mockery of Christ and the cross and his superior sacrifice. But those things were the shadow. They were looking ahead of the coming of Christ. The real thing came when Jesus came. And when you've got the real thing, you don't want to hold on to shadows. And it's absolutely crazy to think that God will restore those things when Christ had come. The shadow and the picture and the examples had served this purpose 
when Christ came. Christ, our perfect, eternal high priest, had come. How do we know that? Well, he's fulfilled all the promises in the Old Testament. And you also remain, uh, remember the veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. What happened to it when Jesus died? Matthew chapter 27, 50 and 51 records the event as follows. When Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rock split. Because the purpose of the temple was over. Jesus, the real high priest, had come and he'd opened the way for us, you see. The question is, have you come to Christ, your mediator? And has he restored your fellowship with your loving creator for you? Have you come close to God through Jesus? Is there any way you can come close to him? Good works, doing good stuff. It's good, but it won't bring you closer to God. Uh, sacrificing yourself, doing hard things. They may be good, but the only way you can be reconciled to God is through Jesus Christ and in trusting in his sacrifice for you on the cross. He's the reconciler, the mediator, the one took the rap for you, you see. Then, lastly, and I'm almost there. Don't worry, guys. You might have to sit much longer. Have you got something cooking at home? Something in the oven? Have you? I see Deborah looks, looking away. Maybe she's got something in the oven. I don't know. Got something nice promise for you, Rob. Yes. I don't, yeah, well, you've also got lunch waiting for us. It's, a, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. Just to get our attention back here. Jesus' sacrifice was for all his people. Now look there at Hebrews 5, verses 9 and 10. Again. Once made perfect, once he finished his work, once he had cried out, it is finished, or said, it is finished, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Not, not for everybody, but for all who obey him. Now, who is it that obeys Jesus willingly and with joy from the heart that is? His people, true Christians, people who are trusting in him, people who love him above everything, anything else. But now some people will ask, but why does it say here, obey him and not believe in him? Are, Christ, are Christians not those who believe in Jesus? Sure they are, sure. But did you know that when you truly believe in Jesus, you will also obey him. Your desires are changed. You are changed as a person. True believers are those of you who are trusting in him with all your hearts and minds and souls for your salvation. And it's that he died for you on the cross and that he was raised from the dead for you. But true believers are also those of you who have surrendered your lives fully in submission to his lordship. And that means you are obeying him. In other words, obeying the gospel message involves two things. Faith in Christ, that's wholehearted trust. You give nothing back, you trust in him alone. And the obedience that comes from faith, that is complete surrender. Jesus is both saviour 
and Lord for you. What's the first step of obedience in a Christian's life? Anyone? There's one first command, baptism. Yes. Believe and be baptized, you see. Very important. Luke 9 verse 23 says, Then he said to them all, Anyone who would come after me must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Living the Christian life means dying every day to myself. My plans, my ideas, my strivings. And hoping to obey Jesus in everything. Even if it will cost you your life. It's very important. Understand here, uh, if anyone wants to come after Jesus, he must take up his cross daily and follow me, says Jesus. Now, what was the cross in those days? It was a place of execution where you died. Maybe today it would be something like the gallows or the electric chair. So, you need to take up your place of execution. You, you need to be willing to take up the electric chair if it comes to that. You, you, you must be willing to take the death sentence if that is necessary daily in your following of Jesus. It's that serious, you see. Job put it this way in his suffering. He said, even if he slays me, still will I trust him. Meaning, even if he kills me, I will still trust in him. Dr. Rex Matthew once put it this way. We were all gathered around his table uh, in his office. He was the principal of the college, Baptist College in Johannesburg and Parktown. And all his final year students were sitting around this table and listening to him. And he put it this way. Even if he sends me to hell, still will I love him and praise him and worship him. He's worthy, you see. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't send Christians to hell, obviously not. But even if that should ever happen, if I have to go through hell or whatever, still will I worship the Lord. It's for those people that Jesus died. It is for who, for you, whom Jesus becomes the source of eternal salvation through his death. Now it's very interesting here that Jesus, we said that, gave his life for his people. He died for his people, those who believe, those who trust in him. There's another view of his death, that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, everyone. Just like generally died for everyone, and that it is up to people to come and commit their lives to him and to make that sacrifice effective for themselves when they come and trust in him. Just like he died with no one particularly in mind, and in the hope that some would turn to him and come to him. <coughs> I would want to bring you a, a better view of atonement. And I would call that not a general atonement, but a purposeful atonement. A definite atonement. A particular redemption, if you like. That Jesus did not die for the faceless mass of people uh, uh, in the hope that some may believe in him, but he specifically and definitely came to die for you. 
not for the sin of every individual that ever walked the face of the earth, but for the sin of his people. He paid the full price for them. Those who trust and obey him, those who believe from every tribe and language and ethnicity and nation in the world. That's what he said. Matthew 1 verse 21. That's what the prophecy said. You must call him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Mark 10 verse 45. He came to die as a ransom for many. True, for many. Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5 there. Jesus came and the Father chose those who are his before the foundation of the world. Now there are verses that people bring and that people misunderstand like John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. But that word world, one must be careful there, because does that mean every single individual in the world? Or does it mean people from every tribe and tongue and nation? As you will find in Revelation, when we see a picture of our future, people from every tribe and tongue and nation are gathered before the throne of grace. And it's certainly not everyone, most definitely not. And John was Jewish, so he must understand that from his perspective, uh, God's people were the Jewish people. And now that he's saved and he sees Christ's love goes out to all the nations, he calls it the world. But does he mean every single individual in the world? I don't think so. Matthew, Hebrews 5 verse 10, once made perfect. Once he finished his work, he became the source of eternal salvation for everyone. Huh? For the whole world, for the wicked, for anybody, people who turn their backs on him, people who don't know. For all who obey him, you see. Now why do I make such an issue of this? Because Christians often lack assurance of salvation. Because they don't understand all these things. And when you are not sure whether you are saved or not, uh, you're not going to serve God with the right motive. You may serve him from terror and fear and not from faith. Or you may not serve him at all. So I want you to leave here today to have a renewed understanding of your own unworthiness of God's grace, but also with a new understanding of just how secure you are in the Lord. That it didn't depend on you to wake up one morning, to come to church, and then, I chose Christ. Well, I needed to do that, obviously. But the things got far, far deeper than that. Before the beginning of time, God had your name written in his heart. And in the fullness of time, he sent his son to come and die for you. Purposefully. To save you. And then when the time was right, he sent his Holy Spirit to come and regenerate you and make you alive so that you would trust in Christ and see the beauty of the Father. And so you would in inherit eternal life. Listen to Hebrews 9, verses 24 to 28. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. That was the man one. It was only a copy. It was a shadow, an example. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence, the real tabernacle, the real temple. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters 
the most holy place every year with the blood that is not his own. When Christ would have, then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of all the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ the sacrifice wants to take away the sins of many people. Not all people, many people. And he will appear a second time, not to be a sin, but to bring to salvation to everyone. No. In line with his purpose of election and his death on the cross, when he returns again, he will come and fetch, bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Those who are waiting for him. My brothers and sisters, Jesus came and died for you, specifically you who obey the gospel. He had your name specifically written in his mind, in his heart. He gave his life for you specifically and definitely. My name is graven. Where? On his hand. Is that other word goes? Yeah. Yes. Definitely, purposefully, for you specifically on that cruel cross. He came to fulfill the will of the Father for you, who had chosen you from eternity, even before he created the world, to be a specially adopted child. And he dealt very effectively with all your guilt and all your sin. In fact, God the Father cancelled all your guilt, remembers all of your sin no more, and overlooks all your failures because of Christ, his dear son's sacrificial death for you. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Huh? All those the Father had chosen will come to Christ. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of, of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. So we are secure. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. He has come to set you free indeed. To give you abundant eternal life. Which you can start experiencing right now in your walk with him. But then you need to come to Christ and put your trust in him. Turn away from your sin. Trust in him alone. And he sets you free from all your guilt and all your sin, from the power of sin, and even from the consequences of sin. And I mean by the consequences, I mean God's eternal judgment. Once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Amen. You guys look tired now. <laughs> Not even one hallelujah this morning. Oh, man. These brothers are from Nigeria. When you go to church in Nigeria, how do you worship? You say, Amen. Hallelujah. You do. If you clap. Yes, there's joy. Yeah, there must be. You're safe in Jesus. Yes, he's done it all for you. Our response should be gratitude and great joy in our Saviour and our God. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. You are so good to us came to save us from our sin, our biggest problem. And the little ones are nothing for you, Lord. 
You can provide for us. You do all the daily things for us that are relatively easy in comparing, in compared to this one, for dealing with our sin. Thank you so much.